works. Okay. Hey, thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rebecca Fisher. I'm one of the co-hosts of Rocky World Discussions, and I'm going to be moderating today's meeting. Um, so we'll start with some introductory remarks, and then we will have our uh, invited talk, uh, something like 30 to 40 minutes, uh, followed by discussion, um, and then we'll close uh, by the end of the hour. Um, just a couple of netiquette things before we start. Uh, please keep yourself muted during the talk. Um, and if you're asking a question afterwards, uh, use your full name. And if possible, please keep your video on while you're speaking. Um, okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Razvan Karakas at IPGP. Uh, Razvan is a computational mineral physicist who has studied the properties of a very wide range of Earth and planetary materials uh, to better understand phenomena ranging from the internal structures of the Earth and other rocky planets and exoplanets, uh, all the way to the formation and evolution of the Earth's atmosphere and hydrosphere and other questions related to habitability. Um, and today he's going to be telling us about uh, some of his work on the condensation of planets from protolunar disks after giant impacts uh, using molecular dynamic simulations to study the properties and evolution of vaporized silicate following giant impacts on rocky planets. Uh, so take it away, Raswan. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Okay, yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this invitation. And thank you for putting together all this series of talks, which are one of the few advantages of using Zoom these days. It's nice to see so many people from all over the planet, actually. So uh, what I will present you in the following half an hour or so are results from simulations that I've done over the last few years concerning the behavior of matter during large and giant impacts. And once we've, the impacts happen, we try to understand uh, how these portal lunar disks form, what are their properties, and how they condense. So impacts, they're all over the place in our solar system. The accretion itself was generated by impacts, all sorts of bodies congregating together, accreting, that meant uh, not only gluing, but that meant uh, impacts. And some of them were very large. We have leftovers of those impacts on the moon, of course. You can see uh, when you look at our satellite, uh, plenty of impacts, all its surfaces cratered. Uh, there are other moons and other uh, objects from the solar system. Uh, there, are, there are things like Mercury missing mantle and so on. So really we have uh, impacts and giant impacts all over the place. Now, our story starts in the very beginning of the solar system by the end of the accretion. We don't know exactly when, but probably between 60 and 100 million years, what happened was that two bodies uh, hit each other. And one of them was the Proto-Earth, and the other one was an impactor that we call today Thea. Now, what you see on this uh, image is a simulation performed by Robin Cano at Southwest Research Institute, where uh, we see the evolution of a system of two bodies uh, that undergo an impact. The simulations themselves are called SPH, Smooth Particle Hydrodynamics, and they try to elucidate what happens with the different fragments and the matter of these two bodies when they put together. Now, there are different versions of these simulations. There are many people who try to model what happened during the, during the impact, but then you see that in all this, if the bodies and the energy of the impact is large enough, we end up with a disk. And here you have two major models of giant impacts, of a giant impact that was most likely corresponding to the one that formed our moon, uh, it, you end up at the end of the SPH simulation, which can last a few hours, like live, uh, live hours, like real life, uh, real time uh, 
it lasts a few tens of hours, you will always end up with a central body that is extremely hot and dense, and an outer part of the disk, which is more or less rarefied. Right? And we either had, have the canonical model, where we have two bodies that have relatively similar sizes that have a head-on collision, or you have the fast spinning Earth model, uh, where the proto Earth would spin extremely fast. That means fast means an hour, a day lasting a few hours, two or three hours. And then this extremely fast rota fastly rotating body gets hit by a smaller impactor. And in both cases, canonical or fast spinning, the result is the formation of this very large disk. And out of the disk, the moon and the Earth somehow condensed. So what we're trying to do was to study the properties of materials that undergo such an impact to see what, what is all about this disk and how it evolves over time. Now, in order to do this, uh, we need to go and look at the, how the system behaves in a phase diagram. And I guess that by now many of you have seen this. Uh, we like to work in a system that is temperature versus density. While normal petrologists will work in pressure temperature or temperature pressure, in our simulations, it's easier to keep the volume fixed, so to have to decide on the density. Now, in this simulation, at high density, we have solids that are the stable phase. Those solids are either the condensed cold phases. If you increase the temperature, the solids would melt, will end up being liquid. If the density is very low, then you end up with a rarefied system, which is a gas like our atmosphere. At very high temperatures, the gases and the liquids, they are the same. You just go from one to another without a phase transition. Now, in this system, we have what I like to call the little elephant, which is this gray region where you, there is no one single phase that is stable. Inside, at a given temperature and density inside, you will have a mixture of different phases that are stable. So for example, at the temperature of the triple point, you would have gases, liquids, and solids coexisting. Along the melting line, you have a liquid and a solid at the same temperature, but at different densities, and they coexist. Right? At the end of the gas and liquid separation is liquid vapor dome, we have the critical point. And above it is the supercritical fluid. Now, what we do is that we start with this system and we put in it the, our initial proto Earth. All right, so our little planet had some solids that could be inside or the surface, liquids, this can be oceans, that can be lavas, anything that is liquid, right? And the gas, so it can have some atmosphere. Now, in this planet, right, in this proto Earth, uh, we have the giant tip up. So we will have shock waves propagating. Now, the moment when the shock wave propagates inside a material, that wave compresses the material, but it also hits it very high. And the energy of the impact is actually, it's transformed into its past to the material that is shocked, which becomes uh, denser, but also becomes extremely hotter. There is a lot of entropy that is stored during that process, which makes it that the initial state, which can be liquid, solid, gas, and so on, would be would be transposed, would be really taken along an equation of state along, which is called a hugonio. That this hugonio tells you how the material behaves as a function of shock. So this shock wave goes through the material. This would be uh, would become denser, hotter. In the case of a planet. Of course, you'll have the shock waves going through, they will come back, there will be reverberations, they all mixed up uh, one on top of the other, but eventually you end up with something that is extremely energetic, extremely entropic. And who says entropy it says a lot of temperature, says that you go along the liquid and the super all the way up, reaching at least the supercritical fluid, maybe warm dense matter state. Now, once you reach these places, so the different parts of the planet would go to higher or lower temperatures, but they would all increase their temperature. And once all these waves go and uh, they finalize to propagate, the system wants to relax. Now, relaxation means a release of the shock waves and a start of the, of the cooling, because the system would be at very high temperatures. Now, because this is isolated, even if it's a huge ball of, uh, of liquids and vapors and everything, 
their entropy is preserved. And actually the best thing that we can do today is to model the trajectory of this object that starts to cool as if its entropy is conserved. So because of this, we will assume that the system evolves along, along vast isoentropic trajectories. That means that they want to go different parts of, of the disk. They will want to go from these high temperature, high density states along isoentropic trajectories, this constant entropy, right, towards the zero. That means like total low density, low temperature. And at a certain moment, they will hit the critical, the, the liquid vapor dome. In all, during all this time, you see you have here only one field that would be the, the supercritical fluid or the liquid. All the time that this system stays here, it means that a lot of things can happen. Like you would mix well, there is no phase separation, there will be just atoms moving around, um, convection currents, maybe, uh, maybe some uh, density, uh, some gravitational separation, but there won't be a phase transition. You will just have this homogeneous mass that rotates because of the, of the kinetic moment. Now, the moment when it reaches the disk, you will start to separate, right? Because once you enter in, you want to enter inside, you will separate on one side liquids and on the other side gases. And those liquids will start to separate. It's exactly what happens when you take a shower and then in all that extremely hot environment, you start to separate when the whole thing cools down, the air cools down, you start to separate little droplets and those droplets there will be uh, a friction with the gas as they rotate, and that friction means that they will spiral inwards and they will fall inside to form something that is condensed in the middle, which, uh, which means uh, that you, you will form that condensed phase in the middle of this disk. Now, in all these things, the critical aspect is the position of the critical point. Because if this critical point is low in temperature, it means that the state, the disk, will spend a lot of time in this super critical homogeneous monophasic state. So in the end, it will be very well mixed in terms of both chemistry and isotopes. But if the super critical point is very high in temperature or very high in density, this monophasic state will be very short. And it will be followed by a very long biphasic state where the things will separate. So at the end of the day, your Earth and the Moon, so the two objects that separate, will be much less well mixed in the case of a high temperature critical one. So this is what we are trying to uh, calculate, because measuring this is very complicated and requires shock experiments that are hard to interpret, and on top of that, they are very expensive. Now, in order to do that, we need to add the third dimension to our graph. That sub-dimension is the pressure. So what we will do is that we will do a series of calculations where we will compute using all these complicated formalism, fab initial molecular dynamics, and so we will calculate how the pressure varies as a function of density at a given temperature, like an equation of state. And what we see is the following. We do this at several temperatures. And what we will see is the following. We will try to calculate the position of these blue points that separated the liquid and the gas. So every single line that is a curved line here represents calculations along an isotherm. And let's start with this first one, the outermost one. At high density, you have liquids that are stable at high temperature. Right, so at, at, high, at high density, you would have liquid. So we are, let's say, at five, six, seven thousand degrees. The temperature, as you increase the volume of your simulation, you decrease the density, meaning that you let the atoms just go away from each other to relax. As the, the density decreases, as you would expect, the pressure decreases, decreases, decreases. At a certain moment, it's so stretched that gas would like to form and then the liquid would become metastable. In our simulations, we keep on decreasing this density until we reach a minimum. At this minimum, we will certainly have such a stretching on the bonds present in the liquid state that they will, they will just burst open. And at that moment, you'll start to form bubbles. And in those bubbles, we usually have atoms flowing inside like a gas phase. 
Unless the density of this entire system keeps on decreasing, the gas that accumulates that becomes to be more and more and more free atoms in these bubbles, the density would increase and it will reach another maximum. And then the whole process is the same on the other side of the gas phase. And now there is a construction, this horizontal line here, that tells us where are the, equi the equilibrium points, which are the blue points between the liquid on the right side and the vapor on the left side. So everything in between the densities of this equilibrium inside, there will be a mixture of the two. And what we are trying to do in our simulation is to determine this, but what we do in practice is to determine the minimum, which is called the spin order. This is something that we can obtain quite reliably. And the position of this spin order line will end in the critical point, just as the equilibrium bimodal lines. So what we will do is that we'll do a series of calculations at different temperatures, higher and higher and higher. And at a certain moment, you will see that the pressure will just keep on decreasing without minimum and maxima. You don't form gas anymore. It means that you go from something that looks like a liquid to something that looks like a gas without seeing a phase transition. That means that you're in the supercritical regime. And this is how we put in place the position of the critical point. Now, we did this for a whole set of systems. And for example, if you look here at the bulk silicate ups, right, so which we call pyrolyte, you see that we have minima, which are the spin orders, up to a certain point, and at around 6,500 Kelvin, which is much higher than anything you could get in a lab, in a petrology lab, there is no minima anymore. You also see that we have quite a lot of scattering in our data. So that means that the position, the position of the critical point is in between this point and this point in terms of density and between 6,500 and 7,000 Kelvin in terms of temperature, because we are an, around this point here. So after we did this on, on several minerals and, felt and, the, and silicates and oxides and iron, what we saw is that in general, most of the silicates are in this region below one gram per centimeter cube. So this is where the, the density of the critical points are. They are also at pressures at around one kilobar. Now the temperature, it really depends on the amount of uh, volatiles, but also on the amounts of moderately volatile uh, elements like potassium and sodium versus things like calcium and titanium that are more refractory. With respect to this, iron is at much higher density and certainly much higher temperature. So now, what we will try, let me just show you in a few, in a couple of slides, what this melts look like. And then we'll try to put this into the context of the actual giant impact. Now, what you see here are um, a simulation, uh, the results of one of our simulations. Uh, and we have a fixed density that corresponds to a pressure of about zero GPA and the temperature is 3000 Kelvin. We have our bulk silicate earth composition all mixed up in a melt. The atoms, you see that they move around, meaning that they diffuse. And each atom here, each atomic type is color coded. Now the silicon, which is in yellow, the big, large uh, yellow balls here, they are surrounded most of the time by four oxygens, which are the small red uh, circles, red uh, balls. That means that we have SiO4 tetrahedra, and they are the ones that keep the melt together. This is a standard silicate melt. That's exactly what you would see when you look at volcanoes erupting and lavas. The structure of this melt is formed of this backbone of silica tetrahedra, and in between you have the, the cations that move. All the atoms vibrate, but they diffuse, we have a melt. Now, if you would take this and you would increase the pressure very much, you would go to a highly dense uh, structure, which is dominated by octahedra instead of tetrahedra, and again, the cations in between. This is the upper part of the magma ocean, that on the right is the lower part of the magma ocean and the contact with the core. Now, if instead of going at high density, high pressure, we go at high temperature, we go into the supercritical regime. And then you see in this simulation that the chemical behavior of the atoms is totally different in this system than what we saw before. There are no more SiO4 tetrahedra. There are a lot of SiO2s, SiO3s. There are many cations just floating totally free. There are even oxygen molecules. 
like this one here. There are even moments where there are all zones forming. So this super, there are also a lot of uh, variation, local variation of how many atoms you have in a given space of the cell. So the supercritical fluid would behave very differently from anything that we are uh, used to when we look in the lab at, uh, at a normal silicate map. And what we saw, if we have to look at a few of these properties, one of the most intriguing properties was that we found oxygen and ozone at very high temperatures. And it's not only, not only us, because other, other groups who did the simulations, other minerals on which we did simulations, we would always form these oxygen molecules, some of them long lasting, at high temperature, and even ozone, the lifetimes of the ozone is extremely short. So it's very much a ballistic effect. Just three oxygen atoms getting together, they stay there for a little while and they go away. A little while means a few femtoseconds. So fragments of, an, of a vibration, of a molecular vibration. While the oxygen atom, while the oxygen molecules, they are present there and they last for many vibrations as you saw in the previous movie. Now, we do the same thing, but where things are much more interesting is inside that liquid vapor door because this is where we will see a phase separation. We, are, we expect at these conditions of density of the global system to have a mixture of liquid and of, and of, and of, and of gas. So you see this point here, which is about one gram per centimeter cube on 4,000 Kelvin, you definitely see a very large long polymer that corresponds to something that we identify as a liquid, that surrounds an empty space where sometimes free atoms would fly inside. And this is the, these are the gas phases. The gas is highly rarefied. And statistically speaking, we have fewer atoms in the gas phase corresponding to a very low density, right? Than the other part, which is this very long, uh, large polymer. Now, we can separate the two. And for example, we did this for feldspars, and we looked at very large uh, polymer with some uh, atoms that are or fragments, clusters that are separated inside. This surface that you see here corresponds to the surface of equal of low electronic density. So you have your atoms and because of the electro the bonds, the electronic bonds, they are all these atoms that are surrounded by the surface of a low electronic density that can be uh, that could correspond, you can see it as the surface of your bubble. And inside this bubble, you will have these fragments that we can go and analyze. So we do this exercise. And for example, what we will see is that as you increase the temperature at a given density, at the very beginning, you have that large polymer, which corresponds to large clusters mm -hmm. and small clusters that corresponding that correspond to the gas phase. So we see a total, very clear bimodal behavior of the system in terms of liquids and gases. But as the temperature increases, you put more entropy to the system, you put more energy to the atoms, they can more easily fly, there are even larger fragments that separate and they traverse these bubbles. And eventually at very high temperature, it's a continuous distribution of sizes. That is what corresponds to a supercritical fluid, something where it's very hard, you cannot separate between a liquid-like and the gas-like. So the, the distribution of uh, sizes of these clusters as they go in and out and out, and you see that they are low, they have low lifetime, so they don't live to show because there are a lot of variations and oscillations of the local density. Now, we also looked at things like, for example, charges, and we needed simulations on MGO. And uh, what we saw is that the charge on the atoms in the bulk is very high, so the bulk is ionic while the surface is very low to zero, and most probably the isolated atoms out would be either low charged or neutral. And we see that because every single point that you see in these diagrams represents one atom. Now you look at the charge, the positive would be the magnesiums and the negatives are the oxygens. And then you see that there are atoms that have a very low charge on the left side, and the same atoms on the right side have also a very low coordination number, meaning that these atoms are very close on one side and on the other side, on the boundary, on the surface of the bubble, while the other ones that have large charges 
they correspond to the bulk, meaning that the bulk is highly ionized. Okay, so now let's try to go back into our phase diagram, right? So we saw what the melt looks like, what are its properties. So why do we care about this? So what we tried to do with Sarah Stewart, who did the SPH simulations, was to put in this context some of the giant impacts that she would simulate. And what we saw is that if the two bodies that get hit into each other, if you have, for example, two mass size planetary embryos, right, so really small, then you would melt almost everything, but you will not go into the supercritical fluid or not much, it's like almost nothing. Meaning that you will have a very large or, or a large disk that's all molten and then it, some would be vaporized and then it comes back. Now, if the giant, if the impact is really giant, so if you have a lot of energy in your system, then almost everything goes around the pyrolyte, the pyrolyte critical point. So it really goes beyond the, the critical point of the bulk silicators, meaning that either in a carbonical impact or a synestia like fast spinning impact, you would end up a lot with a lot of material in the supercritical part some in the vapor, some in the melt. And then it means that from this region all the way down to condensing the two bodies, you will spend a considerable amount of time where everything could be well mixed. Now, if we look in the inside a model like the a disk, like the Synestia, then you will see the different parts of the disk would behave differently chemically, even if the global composition would be the same. Because as you go towards outside, the temperatures and the densities will change. So inside you will have a high density melt, then you will have a rarefied supercritical regime, C1.9 and 8000 Kelvin, uh, where there is a lot of kinetic, atom, uh, kinetic energy to the atoms, but on the outer parts, the density is very low and you actually have a gas, a rarefied gas. While the moon, when it forms as a moon magma ocean, would have something that looks very much like the silicate on the surface, uh, like lava silicate on the surface of the Earth. Now, once you form this disk, the whole disk will want to start cooling down. So you start in the beginning, in, this, in the case of this large giant, uh, giant impacts, by a single phase, or almost single phase, supercritical disk, right? That is highly homogeneous. It will be at high temperature going around the supercritical point. And now you want to decrease the temperature, so go towards zero. And we put it again in the same context of the elephant as before. Now, what will happen is that the moment when it will reach, it will touch the disk, the liquid vapor, you will form <coughs> liquid droplets on one side and gas on the other side, on the left side and you will start to separate them. These liquid droplets, they will start to separate and they will fall. Now here in this diagram, there is no center or outside that is a geometric construction. This is a thermodynamic construction. So in the geometric construction, those liquids that would form on the outer part that are cold, cooler of the disk, they will start as they spiral inwards, there is friction and that friction will drag them towards the center of the, of the disk. Well, they just keep accumulating. But over time, the disk cools and cools and cools. There will be more and more droplets falling in. They would accumulate to form eventually an Earth-like part, also a Moon-like part, then behind it's left a, a disk atmosphere. Okay, so <laughs> geometrically speaking, we'll have this very condensed hot inner body, which is the Earth, that connects as a magma ocean. On the outer side, most probably, and that's a question to find its answers in the next years, most probably, is the moon that forms from some sort of emulsion of droplets that didn't have the time to fall in. And in between, at least in the very beginning, you would have a disk atmosphere that is formed of, is dominated by silicates and oxides. So we can actually go now back into our simulations and we could go and check to see what is the chemistry of this part, but most interestingly, what is the chemistry of the atmosphere that is left behind? Now, if we look at the clusters of atoms in the absence of volatile, so there is no water and no CO2 here, 
It, this is purely dry. All right, so if we look there, what you see is that the gas phase is a mixture. It's formed of a mixture of SiO, O2, SiO2, and so on. Now, the gas phase is dominated. So the, atmos the, the atmosphere in the disk is dominated by SiO. And this corresponds very well to thermodynamic models like free energy minimizations. Now, when I was showing these slides at, uh, at Goldschmidt, I decided to put these little pink hearts on them. Because why? That means that in our simulations, you see, we have this. We have SiO, we have O2, we have SiO2, we have FeO2. And now this FeO2 disappears on every single system, every single silicate where we have iron. So we would always see it out in the disk. Now, these simulations, our simulations, they take weeks or months to run. On the other hand, you could go the other way around and use data from Janaf, whose acronym I don't remember exactly what it means, but it contains uh, thermodynamic data. So there are thermodynamic data for all sorts of compounds in the solid phase, in the liquid phase, and in the vapor phase. And you have things like the heat of vaporization or the entropy of vaporization. So there are several codes that are available, uh, some, I think that they are all, all free by now, that use this Janov data, thermodynamic data, that, and then for a given chemistry of your silicate melt of your planet, you could predict what would go into the vapor phase. And all this, in order for that to function, you need to have the right thermodynamic data for the different components that will go into the gas phase. And what you see is that the FeO2 is missing that little pink heart because all the other ones exist in Janov, exist in our simulations, but FeO2 doesn't. So that means that from the beginning, the free energy minimizations in this Gibbs approach would miss at least eight or 9% of the gas phase in terms of chemistry. What you see in this diagram are all the white vapor species that are present for at least 1%. So at least 1% of the vapor phase is made of this. But then we see many more others. Here you have the list of all the species that are between 1 and 0.1% of the total phase. And now there are many more clusters that we see in the simulation, but they don't exist. They don't have yet. They don't have thermodynamic data. And if you look at the minor, you see there are quite many of them. And when you look at the minor phase, it's plenty of them. So most of the minor phases that would exist just a very short time, they don't exist. So these are simulations at 4,000 Kelvin. They don't exist in the thermodynamical tables on top of the temperature and so And there are even more of them. All right. So that means that when we are trying to look at this uh, the chemistry of this disk that is left behind, and that also applies to things like lava planets, that where you have a continuous evaporation, like some of these super hot uh, exoplanets, uh, much of this uh, thermodynamic modeling uh, would miss a lot of parts, and also it would miss all that chemistry that happens uh, in, the, in, in this atmosphere. So, I have a few more slides that I can show later on if you're interested, but just to, to have a few words, a few, a few thoughts as concluding. Uh, well, we know by now that impacts uh, dominate young solar systems. We find them everywhere, accretion happens with them. Now, in terms of the giant impact, uh, the giant impact is a good theory. It explains a lot of things, it explains similarities between the moon and the earth. Uh, in, no matter how we do this, but the giant impasse will end up with hot, large disks. And they are extremely hot. And they are extremely hot. They will stay in this hot monophase region for a long time, meaning that this will give time for the disk to homogenize, which eventually will produce a moon and the, and the, and the nerves that are very similar in terms of chemistry and isotopes. But just looking at the systems, it's very hard to distinguish. It's very hard to say, oh, we should have a canonical impact or it was a Sinestia-like model. Because thermodynamically speaking, they all end up in the same region of the phase space. Right? And then what we saw is that once as the condensation happens, it's so hot that it goes very close to the supercritical regime. And in the very beginning, when you form the Earth, that Earth will not have a surface. You will not be able 
to float on that magma ocean because that magma ocean would be would have a continuous transition towards a very hot and dense atmosphere right? and that atmosphere is dominated by oxides and things like silicon oxides and iron magnesium and so now once you have volatiles like CO2 and H2O, things are a bit different. H2O will go into the melt, CO2 will go out. So that CO2 will dominate your atmosphere. And then over time, you will have all these heavy species that would fall into the gravitational well of the two bodies that start to condense. And the atmosphere in the end is left over just with the volatiles. This is why we don't breathe today silicon oxygen atmosphere. Right? So all these incompatible volatiles will be left outside like CO2. And this is why the very first atmosphere of the water below, the secondary atmosphere was very rich in CO2. Okay, And most probably, and I think that this is something that we should work more in the following, is that the moon being so similar to the Earth, in this context, it means that there should have been some sort of in, an emulsion similar in composition to the rest of the disk. They didn't have the time to completely separate. It stayed outside of the Roche limit. And this is what led to the formation of the moon, that it was so similar because the disk was so similar and so well mixed. And in the end, we have so many similarities in terms of chemistry and isotopes before, between the moon and the Earth. Well, thank you for your attention. I think they are iron out of time anyway. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Hey, thanks so much, Razvan. Really fascinating talk. I love those movies. I could stare at those all day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I should put them on YouTube. <laughs> uh, we have time for questions. Uh, if anyone has any, um, please raise your hand or type it into the chat or... Yeah, Kaveh. Hi, Razvan. Uh, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you um, for this. You. This was uh, really stimulating. Um, I'm wondering if you've done any calculations on um, mixtures that include not just silicate liquid and vapor, but also uh, metallic iron or some sort of uh, metallic alloy. Uh, because if we think about the protolunar disk, of course, uh, the moon. Uh, you know, also has, um, you know, a non-negligible metal fraction. And yes. I'm wondering if you've looked into how that would um, influence. Uh... Yeah, so we did it a bit. So we worked on pure iron. And then what we showed that there was so much entropy put in that iron that if you have fragments that are all by themselves, if, if they, don't, they are not surrounded by melts, silicate melts and mantle, they could evaporate. So I even said that most probably a lot, large part of the impactor's core would evaporate because there was the entropy to evaporate there. Now, when we try to look at mixtures of, of liquid mixtures of mental and the core, and what we saw, so we are on the way to write the paper and so, but at around 5,000 Kelvin and slightly above, they would mix below that, they would start to unmix. Okay, uh, and so uh, when they do unmix, uh, is there um, is there a forthcoming sort of set of calculations that describes uh, the fraction of iron that would be dissolved, or is it uh, a fairly yes. Uh, yes, 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 rapid? No, exactly. So we did some calculations for helium, actually. And when we looked at that helium, we looked at, we put in contact iron with silicate. Uh, These partitioning calculations, you can either do them like this, you put the two melts of your two systems in contact, and we just counted how much time helium spent on one side or the other. But what otherwise you calculate the chemical potentials independently. Now, when we put them together, what we saw is that some of the iron goes in the silicate and some of the silicon and the oxygen goes in the iron. So we could potentially estimate the a sort of a mixture. So a mixture, this is how we do the mixture now, but we can also estimate the composition, how much silicon and iron you could dissolve into that. No, silicon and oxygen, you could dissolve into that iron as your big droplets of iron falls through the magma ocean. 
So we are on the way to do that. The, the, the numbers are yet yeah, a few way, a good few weeks. Okay, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin, you want to ask your question? Hi there. Yes, my name is Martin Rusroth. Thank you so much for your talk. I was just wondering, you showed a diagram with uh, pressure and density and calculation for different temperatures. And then you mentioned that there was, uh, did you solve these yeah. shapes? Well, but there was sc scattering around, the points were scattered. Uh, that's yes. Right. So I was wondering, so these are calculations. So what are, I mean, there were, why, 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 I, I didn't quite understand why the scattering would, uh, was it? Oh, yeah, because, that one, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, because we have a limited number of atoms, the way we do this, we simulate the melt. Instead of having an infinite number of atoms, we have a little box, which is a cubic box that is just periodically repeated. Fewer you have box inside, uh, atoms inside your box, more you have uh, oscillations of pressure, temperature, and so on. And that's what we see. Now, this scattering is because things are so going all over the place around the critical point that you have these density fluctuations. And we have 150 atoms here. Now, more recently, and I was just looking at this this morning, I did simulations with 300 atoms. Now, I know that it's not so much 300 with respect to 150, but still, we see that at 300, for example, these curves are much smoother than they are in here. So there is a way, and we are trying to go there. But for that, yeah, we are on the way to fit these machine learning potentials like everybody starts to do now and so. And then we are on the way to do simulations with tens of thousands of atoms. They would be more okay. Because more you have, more you have, it's in reality, right? When you have a, your a sample in a real sample, there you have so many atoms. That actually, when you say that you are at 2000 Kelvin, if you could measure that correctly, you will see that the thermal fluctuations are small. They are large locally, but in the big sample, they are small, they are smooth out. And that's exactly what we do is that when we have 300 atoms, the fluctuation in temperature, instead of being 500 Kelvin, it's only 300. So if we could go to, let's say, 300,000 atoms, so then we will, even if there are some atoms that are very hot and some that are very cold, as an average, they would fluctuate much less. So I would expect this to be much smoother. Okay. But there is also, the by itself, the problem of the supercritical point is that there are these fluctuations. So if you would look at the, at the position in the cell over time, you see that there are a lot of atoms and then nothing, and then again a lot, and then nothing. So depending on how long is your simulation, how well, how many atoms, and so, you would end up having this uh, large scattering. So now you do a simulation with, you said 150 or 300 atoms? 300 I did. So it's 300 I did. And actually what I saw, it's 300 that, for example, the 6,500, it doesn't have a dip anymore. Hmm. So going from 150 to 300, it means that actually the critical point that I estimated here, mm -hmm. it should be lowered by 500 degrees. Ah, interesting. And how long does it does those do those calculations take for you? To... Uh, the whole summer. Uh, the whole summer. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. I see the point. Yeah. I started them in like end of May, beginning of June, and I finished them in mid September. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see we've got one in the chat. Uh, Razwan, the question, would you... See, so would you expect the Earth's atmosphere to be much different? Oh, wow. Uh, ah, that's a very good question. I think that, so let's see, we will not have more or less of the heavy atoms anywhere in the atmosphere. What could change would be the distribution of ox of CO2 maybe, maybe in the very beginning there was, if there was CO2, there was a critic, by from CCs, for example, and that was buried inside, that would have a hard time coming out. Okay, while this uh, impact 
uh, because it mixed everything and that CO2 doesn't want to stay inside. The CO2 that, is, that was preserved inside the earth was only the one that was trapped inside the disc, in the middle of the disc. Anything that was outside, we would expect it to be to stay outside. Now that means that the magma ocean lasted there for a very long time. And there are several papers and we totally agree with those because you have all this rich atmosphere, rich in CO2 that acts as a super greenhouse gas, as we all know. And then the temperature on the surface of the magma ocean would be high for a much longer time. So I'm not sure if the, the atmosphere itself would be different, but the dynamics of the whole system would be different. Probably the amounts of carbons would be different. I don't think that the amounts of oxygen would be so much more different because they are due by late arrivals of other things and life and all these things. Maybe there would be less nitrogen if that nitrogen would be trapped inside. That nitrogen, again, that is not uh, compatible. It doesn't want to bond to anything in the world. So I would expect it to just to go out. Thanks. Uh, Christine, you want to ask a question? Yes. Am I? Oh. Um, hi, Raswan. I was yeah. kind of, um, you, you kind of touched on this toward the end and some of the other questions are kind of on these, like, what would we expect to observe given this model? So I know the models kind of developed to explain similarities between Earth and the moon. Um, <laughs> but uh, are there things that we can expect, like when if if Artemis goes as planned and they make more observations of of things on the moon, or is there something like, you know, if if I, I you had a plot where you had like where different parts of the impactor and the proto Earth end up, so I guess like how mixed they are, like if the yes yes, 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 yes. moons yeah. core the mantle and is it an emulsion versus is it a is it a rocket to the core? You know things like that have implications for um, core mantle composition. Uh, what you know what are like the top I don't know three things or something you would love to see observed to um, help constrain all this. So first of all, I would like to see uh, a disc, but we should we would be very lucky to see this because this disc, the proto lunar disc itself, they don't live too much. What we could see, and this is where it would be interesting to see more and to really have more observations, would be around these lava planets. Because in the case of the lava planets, the situation is kind of like here. You don't have an actual impact, but you have a lava that evaporates. And that evaporation, we should be able to see it in terms of chemistry of that atmosphere. That, in a way, is very similar to here. So if, you, if we would see a protolunar disk forming now somewhere, that we see by, with, a, with a telescope, that would have the signature of if oxygen, of SIOs and so on. And those would be something, some observables. And that's what would be nice to see as an observable to check that what we calculate here, what we estimate here is correct or not. It all comes down to the lifetime of the disk. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for Rasvan? Okay. Uh, if not, let's let's thank Rasvan again for the fascinating talk. Really glad you could make it. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and just a reminder, as we're wrapping up, our, our next talk uh, is going to be on November 2nd, given by C. E. Shu from the Gemini Observatory, uh, all about planetary systems around white dwarfs. Uh, and that talk, uh, again, November 2nd at 1800 UTC. So no, it's a different time.